Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on the show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Jennifer Renwick's journey unfolded from a childhood captivated by nature to a geology degree and a career in veterinary medicine. Her fascination with the American West, kindled during college, led to a love for capturing its rugged landscapes. Four years ago, Jennifer embraced full-time photography, setting her base in Colorado. She, along with her partner, David Kingham, now travel the American West in a trailer, teaching workshops and immersing in creative freedom. Jennifer guides students to connect with subjects and express through their lenses. While landscapes engage her, Jennifer's true passion lies in detailing smaller nuances. Her goal is to evoke emotions and raise awareness of the delicate natural world. Her photography has featured in prestigious platforms and reflects her commitment to responsible nature photography. We discuss her teaching philosophy, embracing failure and the powerful narrative behind each image. This episode provides a panoramic view of Jennifer's evolution, revealing the delicate interplay between her personal and professional life in the realm of landscape photography. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day Jennifer, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Hi, it's so nice to finally meet you. I know meet Zoom meet, but yeah, it's nice to meet you and thank you for having me today. Oh, absolute pleasure. You've been floating to the top of the list that I've got and finally got to meet you as well, which is great, even though it's virtual. Why don't we start with how you got started? What photography, what was your entry into photography and how did that evolve into landscape photography? Yeah. So growing up, my dad did underwater photography. I was very fortunate that I grew up in a household that scuba dives. Both my parents were dive masters. So I was very fortunate to head out an adventure with them. And I'd see my dad take his camera underwater and he'd come back with some really cool photos. At the time, I was a teenager. So I think we all know how that goes. Sometimes you're just, oh, yeah, it's cool. But, oh, I like this over here. And I wasn't too into it but he had a background in photography in that sense so when I graduated from college I went into I am actually a geologist that's what my degree is in and then I did a 180 and went into veterinary medicine and that's what I did for the past 14 years until about seven years ago and it's a very high-paced very compassion fatigued career choice very rewarding, but very hard. My dad at this point, I'm originally from Illinois, a little south of Chicago, and my dad had moved out to Colorado to be closer to Denver. And he's also a geologist, so to the landscapes that he connects with. And it was about this time that I picked up a camera and thought, you know what, I think I want to start this as a hobby, just something to distract me from work after a really long, stressful week. So I started just going out in my backyard and experimenting. I had no idea what I was doing, but that was part of the fun of the process. And finally, after I decided to leave Illinois, after a few life changes, I moved out with my dad to be closer to him and really started picking up the camera, doing landscapes. I should actually backtrack. So when I was in Illinois working my job, I started using all my vacation days to get away (laughs) and photograph. And when I started running out, it just hit me. I think it's just time for a change. 14 years, time to move on, do something new. Life is very short. You got to do these things while you can. So that's when I moved. So I was very interested in the American West landscapes. Obviously, with my geology background, I found them fascinating. And I really wanted a way to translate that behind my lens, use my voice, share what I saw. And yeah, I started out doing a little bit of wildlife first. But then slowly worked my way into landscapes. And yeah, I met David and he was like, I teach workshops and you want to come on the road with me and to the amusement and probably horror of some of my family and friends. I took the dive, went full time. And yeah, we've been teaching and living almost full time out of a travel trailer throughout the West. And yeah, I've just being able to immerse myself 24 hours a day almost into the craft has been very rewarding. It's given me a lot of time to figure out what I like to shoot. It's also given me time to experiment, but just find my photographic voice 
And mm -hmm. I enjoy teaching and helping other people discover those things as well from behind their camera. Okay. So what does photography mean to you now? Uh, income? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I'm very passion-driven with my photography. I really, I follow my interests. I had an epiphany a few years ago because when you start out, I think this is a path that we've all followed. You head for those wide-angle landscapes. You really want to capture that you know, to kind of show people what you were feeling, make them feel like they were standing in that landscape. And I chase those in light and weather in the early stages and got very frustrated as we all do, just because that doesn't, despite what social media says, those types of landscapes just don't happen every day. And we were actually teaching in Yellowstone National Park and we had a few days before our workshop and obviously geology, Yellowstone, photography, marrying all of those together. It's my Disneyland. I love anyone that's been with me in Yellowstone can attest going down the boardwalk. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this. Oh, look at this. Like, it just gets me so excited. And I remember sitting there one morning focusing on abstracts and I went, this is what I like. I like these smaller scenes. Mm -hmm. I, I This is just where I have my voice and I, I could stand there for hours just photographing and I'm always curious about what's around the next corner and what if I use my macro on this scene or this looks like a nicer, smaller scene. I really like to tell the stories of the landscape. Yep. Um, I like to break it down. Here's the larger scene, but here are all these little stories buried into those grander scenes that deserve a voice and a share. And then you can even dissect that further down into abstracts because they too make up the landscape, even though they're just a tiny little detail. So that's, that's really what my photography means to me is just sharing those stories within these landscapes, maybe sharing the details that often get passed by yep. because even the slight little ordinary details can just become extraordinary from behind a lens. Mm. And I've always been a storyteller. So I just enjoy sharing my voice, my thoughts, trying to emit those emotions, evoke those emotions, just to other people, just to show them how fabulous and exciting this world is that we live on. Yeah, fantastic. One of the things that I really like about abstracts in particular and also intimate landscapes is taking them out of context of the larger scene gives you the opportunity to make something that is a little more, bit more unique. Everyone can stand there and get the grand vista, say, of Yosemite with Half Dome and the waterfalls and all that sort of thing. But it's when you focus in on some of those smaller details, whether it's with a long lens or something that's right at your feet, mm -hmm. it gives you that ability, I think, to come up with something that is very unique, but still very much of that place. Yes. Is that something that has influenced your decision to move in that direction? It is, yeah. I think one of the coolest things that I see, it didn't quite influence, but I just stumbled upon this naturally. but. One of the things I like to do is you know, if we've been out with a group of photographers or even with our own workshop, it's everybody has a unique voice. Everybody brings something different to this craft because we all see the world differently. Mm. And what's just astonishing each time, and just this is what gets me, I love it, is that we'll be doing image reviews from our workshop with our students. And we all stood in this, not necessarily stood in the same place, but we visited the same place. Oh. But Everybody has a completely different perspective. And there are times that I see things, even if it's a place I've been to 20, 40 times, I go, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. That's amazing. And everybody just shares their unique voice and their unique story. And I just find, I get a lot of joy out of just sharing those details with the world. And I think just that alone influences just sharing the beauty of even some ordinary things. And it's entertaining because you know, I've been in pretty popular spots just photographing by myself. Like, my favorite story is Zabriskie Point in Death Valley. Everybody mm. knows it. It's gorgeous. Rightfully so. It's, it deserves its time. Um, but there was an amazing sunset happening. And I was turned completely the other way in the parking lot, shooting mud <laughs> on the ground. And I had a lot of people coming up to me, tapping me, like, hey, this is going on. And it's, yeah, but look at this. <laughs> this is amazing. If you zoom in on this, it almost looks like feathers. And they just, oh, okay, yeah, enjoy. So that's one of the things. You just have to have confidence in yourself. And you just, you really have to follow what interests you. Because I've found that when you do that, the viewer connects more with your photo. 
if they can tell that you're passionate about this, you were excited to shoot it, you're you're doing your best to share that story versus just, oh, here's a pretty snapshot. I think it's a little easier to share your voice and your perspective when you do hunt out those smaller scenes because even though it might be a tree in the light, someone can shoot it from this angle. It's something completely different. Someone could be maybe closer to it underneath it, shooting up. It's a whole different story. So I think that's what influences me. There's many more stories and ways to put yourself into those shots Mm. to share with the world versus just the lineup and shoot type snapshot. Those are pretty. And if I always tell people, if that's what you enjoy, my gosh, go do that. No one should ever tell you how to do your art. You shoot what you enjoy Mm. and there's no shame or judgment in that. But yeah, I think just I'm influenced because it's just a way that I can share my voice and just be a little bit more unique. Yeah, nice. You mentioned your background in geology and your father's background in geology. How do you think that has shaped your view of the landscape? So I, it's funny because this was part of that epiphany in Yellowstone that I had. So when I was going through and studying to be a geologist, I had a real affinity for the smaller things that we'd study under microscopes. So thin sections of rock that kind of show you the mineral makeup tiny little things that you find behind a microscope because they were very abstract, full of colors, full of different shapes. It was just fascinating to me. And then when I worked in vet med, a lot of my focus was on clinical pathology. In fact, I was working on getting my certification and board in clinical pathology. So I found myself behind a microscope all the time. Instead of rocks, I was looking at cells and blood and cancer cells and skin cells and all sorts of things. And they too, when you look at them, they're little miniature works of art. They have the same patterns and textures and different colors. I think both of those, and the other thing, the common thread through these is that you're using observation a lot in those two fields. Animals can't tell you what hurts, how they're feeling, Rocks don't just come out and say, hey, I formed, I was uplifted, and then I had a ocean over me. Honestly, heard of these minerals, et cetera. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they don't share that story. So it's all based on observation and for you to figure out the story and kind of figure out what's going on. So I apply that to a lot of my photography. I'm very observational and curious. Uh, so I think that drives why I love natural abstracts so much, because it reminds me of each time that I enjoyed looking through a microscope at things, mm-hmm. but it's also just driven by, well, what is this? How did this get here? Oh, this is interesting. But yeah, I think that ties into a lot of it, but I think I was definitely influenced by my two careers, and I, it took me a few years to realize, like, oh, this is why I like abstracts so much. Like, now it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Cool. In... Looking at your career or your your pathway, your journey through landscape photography, where did the epiphany happen to say, oh, this is art, not just recording, as you say, a snapshot or a a shot of a nice scene, et cetera? Where did that sort of happen for you and how did you make that realisation? So I think it was probably about three years in that I had been doing this full time And it was wandering around Yellowstone when I just realized I just enjoy these stories. I enjoy sharing these. It brought that common thread back from my past, even a little like conceptual blending. So yeah, it took a while. And I think it takes a long time for everyone to find their voice when they're first getting started. And I often tell people, don't stress out. Don't try to find your style first thing. Just Hmm. follow your heart behind the lens, your curiosity, what you love to photograph without all the static of people in the background saying, oh, that doesn't sell or people aren't interested in seeing abstracts. They want the grand scene. Oh, you don't get likes on Instagram or whatever. Right, exactly. That whole. I love black and white. It just doesn't play on social media because everyone goes, no. Black and white. No, and it, it's very disheartening. And I get it because we've all been there where you, you're so excited to post something. You're like, oh, people are going to think this is awesome. And it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, no one even notices or likes this. And the biggest thing to me was turning that around and realizing it's it's not that I'm doing something wrong. It's the algorithm, number one. Social media should never be a barometer of your success or how you're doing or if you're on the right path. Like That's for you to decide. And it's hard to 
blur out that static and really find your voice. And that's that it took me a while to figure that out. And I finally just had to be okay with, you know what, these are the types of things that I enjoy shooting. And that's all that matters to me. I know it's different if you have a gallery and you do sell prints of areas and that's super important. But even I have a few friends that do gallery work and I, I find that they even need to get out of that mindset sometimes just to go out and enjoy photography again instead of being like, oh, I got to chase this thing. I know this sells, but I always encourage people just take time to shoot what you enjoy, even if it doesn't sell, just so you can keep that creative spirit going because I know it can, it bogs us all down. And I know social media is that demon sitting on everyone's shoulders that can just be a total pain. But I would say about, it took me about three years to get to that point, to be comfortable in my own skin, to have the confidence and just say, this is what I enjoy shooting. This is the path that I would like to take. And it all just came together then. I didn't think of a style, but then I had people telling me like, oh, I saw this and I knew it was a Jennifer Renwick. And I think I, sometimes I have a very painterly style, especially with Yellowstone. So it it just developed naturally. And that's how all of this stuff should be. It should never be forced, no stress. But yeah, it took me about three years to finally get to that point where I just, I was comfortable in my own photography skin and I just started following what I enjoyed and didn't listen to outside voices or influences. Cool. Are you a planner? Are you someone that conceptualizes a scene before you get out into the field? Or are you somebody that sort of just gets out there and responds? I, I'm i very much I get out there and respond. I'm very curious. So I head out in all sorts of light. I also don't confine myself to, oh, it's not golden hour. And David and I, usually since we're together, we're always out photographing together. And we just, we wander. I'm curious by nature with my science background. I I just enjoy, I'm a very, like a nerd. <laughs> I love learning about everything. I love, oh, what is this? I'm going to have to like look that up when I get home. Yeah. But I just like wandering and just seeing what nature presents that day. It may just turn out, it was just a nice day for a walk. And that's completely fine. And there are even days that I do leave my camera behind and just go out and enjoy nature. Because I think keeping that relationship with nature going is very important, especially if you're in a slump or you're just not feeling it. Just keeping that relationship going, keeping the curiosity is really what kind of helps propel you through those things. But yeah, I would say 90% of my photography is wandering, being curious and observing and trying not to have any expectations of what the day will lead to at all. And that's hard too in the beginning. It's hard to not think, oh, I want to go out and, oh my God, I want to see this epic sunset here. And I've seen pictures of this and I really want it. And yeah, it's just, it it sneaks up on me occasionally where I'm just like, oh, I want to do this. And I have to walk myself off the ledge and just say, you know what, any day behind the camera is a good day. You just got to enjoy what happens and just embrace the process. And I've been a much happier photographer since embracing that. The only time I say I would plan with David's background in night photography, occasionally we will go out and shoot night photography and we have planned things like meteor showers or the Milky Way is going to rise at this time of night. And we do go out and I enjoy it. I think it's fun. It's just not my cup of tea all the time. So it's fun yeah. to do occasionally. But when I come back to my smaller scenes and abstracts, I usually I don't have a plan. I just wander and just see what the day brings. Okay. Planning aside, do you set yourself any goals in your photography? No, not really. I'd say the only place I have goals are I do a lot of photography projects. I usually always have one kind of brewing in my catalog. And occasionally I will get into that mindset of, okay, we're going back to Zion this year in the fall. Mm -hmm. And that's a particularly good time to photograph leaf oils. And I have like 10 more images that I would like to round out my collection with. So occasionally I'll head out there. Now that doesn't mean like I go out and I'm like, oh my God, I have to get this leaf oil or my world ends. It's just more of a, oh, this is happening. I do have a project like, oh, maybe I can make the two line up and meet. Mm -hmm. I try, I just, I really try not to have expectations. I just, I I found that it just stresses me out and then it puts me in a non-creative space. So I, I really just try to just, 
take what comes. But I would say that's probably the closest that I get to planning is if I do have a project that I would like to go finish. The planning is just more of a let me put myself in that situation and see what happens. It'd be awesome if I get some more images for my project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In terms then, of being, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, other than that, it's just, I, I just like to follow the things I enjoy. Sure. Atmosphere, conditions, steam, Yellowstone, that type of thing. So, yeah, no big planning. <laughs> Creativity is obviously a, a, a big part of what you do. In terms of your own creativity, do you do a lot of experimentation with new ideas or new techniques? Or do you stay with tried and tested techniques and just not necessarily doing the same old, but apply them where they're suitable. Yeah, no, I I think that's very important for every like anyone that's a photographer is just to always embrace new things. In fact, this summer I work part time for a photography conference company, and they were doing a conference back in Chicago, and it was architecture. Now mm -hmm. I had never done architecture in my life. If you had asked me. Seven years ago, do you think you'll ever shoot buildings? I would have said, uh-uh, because -uh, usually I'm not a human element kind of person at all. But I went with an open mind, and I, I just brought my 24 to 200 with me, which is like my walk-around lens that I use all oh. the time. And all of a sudden, I started seeing these abstracts in these buildings, and it was very reminiscent of things that I enjoy photographing in nature. And in fact, I, it inspired a project where I'm comparing some of the natural scenes that I've taken where I found almost an exact match, whether it was in architecture or other city details. So it's like a, I don't have a name for the project yet, but it's very unique. It's very exciting. Like here's some ice, but then here's an abstract of some windows in the city that look just like that ice. So it's like that's nature cool. versus urban. So that inspired something and that was really fun. And that's something I never thought I'd ever have an interest in. But now I look forward to going and visiting a city again. Mm. I do like using ICM. I think that's very freeing. And in fact, there have been some days I've gone out and that's all I've done just because it's fun because you can never really create the same thing twice. It's something fun. I like to teach my students too. And even the people that are resistant at first, like, oh, yeah, I don't think this will be my cup of tea. But 10 minutes later, they've taken like 400 images and they're like, look at this. And it's, ah, see. <laughs> so I think it's very important to step out of your comfort zone, things that you're used to photographing and just mm -hmm. embracing the experiment process or experimentation process because you just don't know. And yeah, it, I think it's important. I also dabble in wildlife a little bit occasionally. It's not my comfort zone at all. But there are certain animals that I've come to enjoy photographing. Like I've got a wild dolphin project that I really enjoy. And we were just in Yellowstone a few weeks ago and had a really cool chance encounter with a wolf pack. So I spent a little time photographing that. Again, felt out of my element, but it was really fun and exciting. And it's just nice to say I tried something different. Yeah, but yeah I like experimenting. One of the things that comes along with experimentation is failures and you try something you know ICM learning ICM for example and learning how to get the right shutter speed for the light as well as the right amount of movement etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot oh, of yes. fail at that when they first try it I know yes. I <laughs> oh I've got files and folders of failures and I think a, a very common misconception is especially with people that have been photographing a while is they just assume other people looking in assume, oh, this person probably doesn't have any discards or oh, any you know, <laughs> bloopers or whatever. And I always tell people, grab a cup of tea or coffee, come over. I will gladly share with you my I've, folder. I've got folders of trash too. Yeah. Fails. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, I think you hit it right on the head. Like, it's very important. And I think learning to embrace failure is also another stepping stone in this field of photography that you just need to be comfortable with because not every outing is going to produce something. And as long as you're comfortable with that and say, hey, I got out, I tried, it was a nice day, a hike, I think that really sets you apart from the, oh my gosh, today just was horrible because it just gets you out of that negative mindset because anytime you have a negative mindset, you automatically shut down your creative process. It's crazy how fast it can just box you in and then you just feel that, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't successful today. And no, embrace failure. 
my gosh, this is the digital age is great. You're not wasting money on film. You can have thousands of them and no harm, no foul, and you've learned something, and that's important. Yeah, and you're never going to show the bad ones to anyone anyway. So. No, no. I mean, we all have them. Like, I, I often tell people it'd be funny just to have a share session someday of our <laughs> horrible images, because I think it would really bring, especially newer photographers in and, you know, make yeah. them comfortable with the fact that it's not just a you go out every single day in the unicorns and the rainbows. This is a process, and sometimes it's very daunting and it's disheartening but you just keep going and you keep trying and that's down the road you have your creative sparks and moments i've just thought of a search that i i need to go on now and find photographers or artists that have actually put together an exhibition of failure yes that would be exciting to see it would be cool too and sometimes even going through those failures you realize oh this is actually cool and then it might lead you down like a completely different road of how did i do this and oh maybe this would be cool in this type of landscape exactly but yeah i think embracing those failures is and just being comfortable with that is super important to help you maintain be a well-rounded photographer yeah Yeah. and happy do you use any particular techniques to come up with that experimentation or is it just something that you've kind built into your process no not too much other than the icm i do like experimenting with like atmospheric conditions Mm -hmm. for those like high key looks so sometimes i'll seek out conditions like fog yellowstone it's really i don't want to say easy but it's steam is the obvious feature there in a lot of the geyser basins that can be easy to work with looking for those conditions I think this is a good one too, like looking for the conditions that produce good black and white images. I think for so long we were told, don't go out midday. There's nothing to shoot midday. The light is harsh. But in fact, that's actually some of the best light to do with black and white. So I'll search that out sometimes to go experiment, uh, mostly with my abstracts and textures. But yeah, I don't really seek out a certain condition or way. I just see how the day takes me, what I feel like doing with my camera, but keeping in mind like, oh, I know that I can get a good ICM at this kind of light or, oh, look at these trees. Maybe this would be something cool to put together. Multiple exposures. I just got a new camera and I'm not, I I know I'm not a technical person and I'm not driven by my gear, but multiple exposures in camera is something new, especially with the mirrorless systems. That's been really fun to play with. And that's opened a lot of creative doors and just fun to play with. So that I'd say that's probably my most recent discovery. And I've started dabbling in that a little bit, nice. but that's fun. We've talked a little bit about the, the failures. How do you define success? I define success for myself personally. If I enjoyed shooting that subject or shooting on that particular day, and I came back with a new appreciation for nature, or I just had a very intense experience out there, whether it was emotional or physical. I think those are my successes because any day out in nature is a great day. But when I've been able to capture something either that I'm feeling mm. or a very unique story in the landscape that I can you know share with the world as you know my perspective on that, I, I think that's a success. I don't enter competitions. They're great. They're just not my cup of tea. I don't value my success by that. I don't even value my success monetarily, like financially. I don't put a lot of effort into selling prints just because I don't have the time. We're on the road most of the time. So it's very difficult to A, either print on our own or work with a lab. I sell maybe one or two prints a year. My focus is mostly teaching and just spending the time photographing things that I love. And to me, at the end of the day, if I've helped somebody discover something new about their camera or just open their eyes to something new that they can do or a smaller scene or the beauty of abstracts or even just a certain sunset on a certain day, like with the light or the storm light that we had and it just opens their eyes to go, wow, I didn't know you could do this. I count those as my successes that I've been able to at least help someone interact with nature in a way or that I just had a very particularly exciting day, whether photographing tide pools or out in the dunes that's what kind of drives me and that's my kind of success 
I maybe would add projects into that. Finishing a project always yeah. gives me a good feeling. But yeah, I would say I'm driven by those kinds of successes instead of how did this do in a competition or how is this doing on social media? I'm just not a competitive person. I just feel that there's room for everybody in this. It's art. <laughs> yep, yep. I don't really know how art has ever been a competition. So I just stay away from those things. And I support anyone that wants to do that. I think they're great. I do think contests have a place in that hierarchy of your photography journey at times. But it's just, as far as I am concerned, I like my successes to be just a little more natural and based on my interactions with the landscape or nature, or if I've been able to help someone else experience it, like the same feeling. Nice, nice. Talking of projects, one of the things that most people that I've spoken to on the podcast have, some people don't do projects at all, which is an, an interesting concept. <laughs> oh, he's got about a half a dozen on. And that's something that I think is really important to me, at least in terms of driving my photography forward. Are you the same in having multiple projects going all at the same time? And how do you switch gears between them when you're out in the field? Yeah, it, it definitely drives my photography. And I have... Brooks Jensen of Lens Work to thank for that because I actually, I was encouraged quite a few years ago to submit a project, the Seeing in Sixes books that he did. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do this. And I didn't really have the confidence in myself, but I did. And I submitted and I ended up submitting quite a few years in a row. And I was very fortunate enough to be in every book except the first year that I didn't submit. And that really opened up my eyes to a whole different world of because projects are a great way to storytell. So since I enjoy telling stories, yeah. a project is a more cumulative way of sharing the complete story of a certain subject or a landscape. I often find that I have quite a few projects in my catalog and some will sit. I will gather images for one and then I, I don't lose interest, but life either gets in the way. A lot of our, just because of our lifestyle, it's it can be tricky because we spend so much time in one location. So we're focused on that. But then, oh, we need to hit the road and go teach in this national park. So then we completely switch gears from the desert to Grand Teton or something where it's completely different. And that's when I find that maybe that project might sit for a while, but that's fine. They can sit there. I like to say they either ruminate or they're marinating I might be in a different location and see something that actually would fit in that project. So that might bring me back to that. But I do find that I am very project driven, again, just for my own storytelling method yep. or my storytelling way that I enjoy sharing my work. And yeah, there are definitely projects that maybe I haven't gone back to in three or four years, but I eventually do. I circle back and go, oh, what? how did I end working on this and oh maybe there's another opportunity to add to this or maybe I combine these projects because even sometimes I've been working on a project and then halfway through another epiphany occurs and I go oh wait a minute you know what this could be even cooler to to share or try to explain or if I use my emotions for this so sometimes then they evolve and then they turn into something completely different and I think that's important. I think that's all part of the process and you need to let those, you know, evolutions happen and not get discouraged. But yeah, I can tell you right now, I probably have over 20 projects that I'm working on. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. just because of time. That's a few, and... that's a few more than I, I try to keep going. I, I can only keep about six or seven in my head at that one time. And yeah. one of them drops off for a, for a year or two and I'll come back to it. But... Yeah. But yeah, I eventually come back to them and just see what I can do or I add to them or they evolve into something else. And some just don't go anywhere, but I still enjoyed the experience or I learned something and that's completely fine. I don't delete a whole lot of my work. I delete the obvious things of the unintentional camera movement pictures or something's out of focus or something just didn't work. I will delete those, but I do keep most of my work because you just never know. And it's fun to go back and peruse a few years later and just say, oh, yeah, look at this. Or I could see what I was trying to do there and you learn something. But yeah, I would say I, I always have a project in my catalog and they're always in the back of my mind. And one question that I get a lot is what came first, the idea or the, the picture or the idea or the project? 
like the chicken and the egg. Yep. And I don't necessarily go out thinking of a project. I don't head out to Death Valley and go, okay, I'm looking for dunes. I'm looking for these types of dunes, these textures. They do happen organically. But there are times when I might be driving like a long distance somewhere and an idea will come to me. What about like ghost trees or something? That could be fascinating. Where could I work on dead trees? And oh, there's a number of locations that would work. So sometimes it it is one way or the other. So it's hard to answer. There's never just one distinctive timeline of, oh, I have this idea, I need this, and I'm going to work on this project. I just let them flow, ebb and flow throughout my consciousness and just pick them up and just go out there. And sometimes I have no idea when I'm wandering and something really benign and simple I come upon and I'm like, oh my gosh, this would be an amazing project. And then it happens that way. So it's it's hard to pinpoint what comes first, but projects do fuel me. They fuel my creative spirit and I enjoy storytelling. So yeah, I always have one in my catalog somewhere marinating. Fantastic. How do you know when they're done? That's always my problem. Yes, that is an issue sometimes. Um, it, it can sometimes be very hard. Sometimes for me, it's just when I'm not interested in doing that. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There are like my dolphin project. I I started out with six images, and every year I've gone back to photograph them. It, it quickly keeps going, um, and I keep picking. And sometimes the conditions are different, and that's fine. And I think a project can be anything from four images to 50. It just depends on the story that you're telling and what you want to share with the world. But yeah, I do find an endpoint can sometimes be hard. There have been a few projects where I've put that last image in. I've looked at the gallery as a whole and gone, this is it. I've looked at them same way and gone, "Mm, this one doesn't quite fit. So I'm going to remove that one. But oh, here's a very similar one, but this one fits a little better and put that in. And some are just open-ended. Like, I'm not sure when I'm going to end them. It depends. On my next trip to Yellowstone, maybe I'll finish my abstracts project. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll find something new. So that can be very difficult, too. But I, like you, I've there have been a few that I've just been like, eh, maybe this is done. Or if, if it's a condition that I can't go back and get again. I had a Death Valley project in the Badlands with, we were very fortunate to see fog. Um, and steam rising off the Badlands one day. And I've seen that twice in my like eight years of pretty much living there every winter photographing. And that obviously has a finale. I had six images from that. They were great, but it's something I'm not going to go back and see. We had to Death Valley in a few weeks. I I don't think I'm going to find that again. So that project is done and I can officially write about it and then like close that door. So those are easier because then you know you're done. It's the ones that you know, I keep going, that can be hard. But eventually, I think you do come to a place where you just have that feeling and you go, okay, I think this completes it. Or this last image rounds this out nicely. Let me write about it and just see if it feels finished. And I just go by that. Yeah, cool. I want to talk now a little bit about the business side of things and the decision initially where you said, okay, full-time photography is for me. How difficult was that decision for you and what thought processes were going on during that decision-making process? It was a very, it was a very freeing decision and also one of the most terrifying decisions I've ever made. So I came from veterinary medicine where you get a paycheck every week and your salary and you're dependent on that to going and saying, oh, I'm done. Like, I'm going to be my own boss now. And the problem with that is when Friday rolls around, when you're first getting started, there's no paycheck. (laughs) I did plan ahead. I did have kind of a nest egg saved up because I'm a planner. I'm a planner in the sense that I I always like to have a plan A or B. While I like to jump fully in and just be like, whatever happens, the little OCD part of my brain still says, you still need to eat. You need somewhere to live. (laughs) That's important. And I got divorced. It was a life change. My mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness a few years before I made this decision. And it just made me, especially her illness, just made me realize this life is not guaranteed and it's very short. It can be very short. So you need to live in the present, live in the now. And if there's something you want to do, go do it, especially at, you know, middle age, because I see so many people 
that wait till they're retired to do things. And I understand that sometimes that's just the way it has to be. But then by when you're that age, it's a little harder to move around. Maybe your arthritis has caught up to you and it's just harder to do those things. David and I were, this is the time in our lives. We're healthy. We're a little younger. We're approaching middle age now and we feel it definitely on some days. This is the time to do this. There's never a given or a guarantee in life. So sometimes you just have to take that dive off the high dive and go in feet first and just see. So I had accumulated a little bit of a nest egg. And then I moved out and very quickly realized how freeing it is to be your own boss, but also how hard it is. And that saying of you you really don't make a livable wage for the first five years or so that you start a business is extremely true. I've been doing this. This is my eighth year, maybe ninth year, eighth year. Mm -hmm. And it was two years ago that finally on my taxes, I realized, oh, like I actually did. You're not a millionaire by any sense of the imagination, but I've not met too many millionaire photographers. No, (laughs) you definitely don't. Yeah. Maybe the fashion guys get a few more. Yeah. (laughs) But I I just remember feeling like, Oh, and it was the first time in six, seven years that I felt like I made it, like I'm doing something right. But it was very scary. And I think just finding a good support group of friends and colleagues, because you guys are going to do the same things, they're full-time photographers. Um, I think that's very important to have a support group. And it took a while. This isn't an overnight success thing. I I, I see a lot of people that say, oh, I've I've sold five prints and I'm going to quit my job and do this full-time. And there are different avenues that you can take as a photographer. And yep. if you want to do the print sales, that's great. I've got colleagues that do that, but it's art show after art show. And you put all your time and money into it. For us, it's teaching our workshops. That's really our core, mm. which is why I made the decision to not focus so much on prints, just because it was a little more difficult for us to do that. Although I would love to do that someday, but it's just not in the cards right now. But it was scary. I think you just have to have, you know, that bravery to just go ahead and take a chance. It may not work. And you know what? That's okay because you still tried. And I, the one thing that I did have is that I could always fall back on my old job. So I did keep my license. I do my CE during COVID. That was probably the most recent scary time that I can think of where when the travel industry shut down and we didn't teach a workshop for eight months, it was a little scary. We had to, we evolved to online teaching and we were very grateful for that. And it opened up a ton of new doors for us, but it was the first time that we both went, we might have to fall back on our old careers for a while. And luckily for me, that's, I don't want to say easy, but the veterinary world, there's always a shortage of techs and vets and staff. So I could very easily just go work in a clinic. It would be very hard (laughs) after being my own timekeeper for eight years of going back to a nine to five, that's a little frightening, but you know what you can, my advice to anyone thinking about doing this is you can definitely do it. You might have to plan a little bit, but you just got to take the leap. You just don't know until you jump. And it was very scary. A lot of my friends thought I was completely crazy. I know I had a lot of people watching just waiting for me to fail, which unfortunately our society has a few people that like to do that, but I'm still here. When it's been a very rewarding experience. And if I hadn't done it, I, I know I'd still be very miserable. Mm-hmm. I loved my old job, but it was just filled with a lot of stress and compassion fatigue and burnout is a real thing. We have the second yeah. highest suicide rate behind dentists, oddly, I, I, yeah. or dentists, <laughs> but I found that kind of interesting. So yeah, it, a break was definitely needed and inspired by my mom's illness and realization that life is never a guaranteed thing. You got to do these things, you know, just follow your passions and follow your heart. And if it works great, if it doesn't, you at least tried and maybe it leads you down another Avenue. Um, but yeah, it was frightening yeah. for sure. I know you do a lot of stuff out on the road, but the places that you shoot, how have they shaped how you shoot? We're very fortunate with the lifestyle that we have, that we are able to spend a month or two in each location. Mm -hmm. And David and I do not teach anywhere that we have not spent extensive amounts of time in just because, you know, we wouldn't be comfortable and we would be doing a disservice to our attendees and participants if it was something we didn't know real well. Because to do workshops, 
you always have to have a plan because mother nature will throw curveballs if you are in death valley and all of a sudden you've got blue skies for three or four days or stretches at a time which is very common it's about being able to adapt and say hey guys you know what you can work with in these kinds of conditions this supply over here is great or the dunes are great during the day let's go work on some black and white or the opposite if it rains or all of a sudden you've got like really unpleasant weather knowing where to go to capitalize on those conditions is important the one thing that this lifestyle has done even though it does have its pros and cons it has been able to allow us to stay in a location and slow down and not have that rush of oh we've got to move on in two weeks to the next spot we're able to really get out hike scout explore and most of these places We've explored for so many years, but we still just feel like we've scratched the surface. There's so much more to do on return trips and revisit old things or old locations or subjects that we like. But I would say overall, it's caused us to really be more contemplative and slower photographers because we don't feel that rush. Or I used to be a weekend warrior and that was always very stressful. I've got two days this week that I can go out and just being able to immerse myself in it 24 hours a day has been very freeing and just very good for my creative journey. And it's made us slower photographers, which in turn allows us to explore things and teach that to our participants as well and share that with them. Yeah, so yeah. that's one thing I've really enjoyed about living on the road. Cool. Do you have somewhere that just keeps calling you back that you've got unfinished business with? Yeah, I would probably say Death Valley. Mm -hmm. Southern Utah is very fascinating to me. There are so many canyons there that I just want to go explore and badlands that we just haven't had the time to. But Yellowstone, I fell in love. I would say if you were to ask me what my favorite national park is, as much as I love Death Valley, I think Yellowstone edges it out just a bit. Because as a budding geologist, we had to do a, a senior thesis or like a final senior project. And mine was heading out west for six weeks to map areas around Yellowstone and the Badlands in South Dakota. And that's where I fell in love with it. And it just, it calls me back each time. And it's just, it's a place where I feel like I'm home. And I know I've only scratched the surface there too. There's a lot of backcountry stuff I want to go see and photograph. But to be fair, Death Valley does run parallel to that too, but Yellowstone edges it out just a little. But Every time we visit Death Valley, whether it's a canyon or another playa or just somewhere we've had to walk or hike to just to see what's out there, we feel we definitely still have unfinished business there. But yeah, I would say, yeah, Death Valley, Utah, and up to Wyoming are probably places that keep calling us. What's been your most memorable shoot? Oh, goodness. There have been a few. Probably, I am probably going to say... A few weeks ago in our winter workshop when we encountered the wolves, yeah. um, it wasn't just, we've seen, we've been fortunate enough to see wolves quite a few times throughout our visits, um, usually through a scope or through our lenses, far away, they're just doing their own thing. But this one, everything came together. So they appeared in a geyser basin where we've never seen them before. And we all got excited because we saw one howling and it stepped out into the geyser basin literally just like 200 yards from the boardwalk. It was super close. And then we turned around and across the road, you had these really pretty snow-covered icy trees, pine trees or fir trees. And there was a, a thermal terrace there that was emitting steam. And all of a sudden the entire pack came walking out of that steam on that terrace behind this like winter scene. And it, it was just one of those moments that... You just can't put words into it. It was just, it was amazing. And it wasn't that they were feeding on a carcass in Hayden Valley. This was quintessential Yellowstone. They were walking across the geothermal features in a wintry scene. It was a pack of 15. It was the Wapiti pack. And they've got some black wolves. They've got some gray wolves, very pretty color contrasts. And uh, I would say that was probably one of the most memorable things. I know it was only a few weeks ago, but it sits right here and I've thought about it frequently when I look at those pictures and even if I didn't have a picture from that day it's just the experience itself was just something so special and so memorable just to see those creatures in an environment that they're known for but just 
everything lined up. And I, most of all, I'm very excited our participants were able to see that because it's a very rare thing um, to see. And yeah, we just got very lucky. Amazing. And it was just, it wasn't planned. It was just, oh, let's just go see what we see. And out they popped. So just a good example of just, you never know what nature might give you. But I would say right now that's running in my most memorable mm. right now. <laughs> what about horror stories? Have you had any dramas out shooting and or things that just went wrong? Not really. We've been very fortunate. As far as workshops, we really don't have any horror stories. We're always, we tend to attract the type of participant that doesn't have those expectations where they do like to wander. They like to adventure. They like to see what they see and be contemplative and slow down. So that really helps. It's not like we're taking a bunch of people where we're like, we're going to stand here. We're going to have Aurora and a unicorn. And here it is <laughs> because that stresses me out. Like I I can't, <laughs> that gives me anxiety if I think, oh, we have to produce this. This better happen or the world's going to end. So I think we're fortunate from a standpoint that we attract other like-minded photographers that enjoy what we do and just want to learn a little bit more. As far as horror stories, the only one that I can think of, <laughs> Dave and I, we were in Crested Butte, Colorado, a place we've visited many years and we should have known better, but it was a particularly good wildflower year. And there's one road in Crested Butte. They're mostly dirt kind of mountain roads, but there's a meadow at the top of this one hill that's just spectacular. And we thought, oh, this is going to be great. In fact, it was date night. So we were going to go shoot and then go into town for a nice dinner. So I'm like in a skirt, nice clothes. Like David and I very rarely dress up. He's in a nice shirt and we've got a three quarter ton pickup truck. That's very heavy. <laughs> and we were watching Jeeps go by us and we're like, okay, let's go. And it had rained the night before. Uh -huh. And out of all the roads in Crested Butte, most are made up of volcanic rock or gravel this one is pure clay and it was quite steep. So we started going up with the just flowers in our mind and the sunset and, oh, this is going to be awesome. And we started to slide. And I remember looking at David saying, gosh, put it in four wheel. And I just remember seeing him go, it is in four wheel. And I was like, oh my God. And there's, <laughs> oh, a, big <laughs> oh, there's a big drop off to the right. And so he just guns it. We make it up the hill. We get out of the truck. And we're looking down what we just came up. And we aren't even looking at the flowers at this point because we're just thinking, how are we going to get down? Because mm. um, gravity always wins. And we've now accumulated a crowd of people at the base of the hill because there's like a dispersed campsite. So they're all watching us. And I said, oh, my God, we're going to be on YouTube. Someone's probably <laughs> saying right now, look at these idiots. Like they should have known, like they can't get that truck up there. So we were very embarrassed. And David said, OK, we just need to get down. So with it being a three quarter ton pickup, it was a slip and slide all the way down. So we finally had to stop at one point because we did came, we came very dangerously close to coming off and rolling. He had chains for winter driving. And he said, I just got these chains. Let's get them out. So I get out and the chains don't fit. They sent us dually chains and we don't have a dually pickup truck. So I said, these aren't going to work. And he's what are we going to do? I said, hang on. I said, what if I just put the chains down in front of each tire and you just slowly go down so at least you have some traction? And he's like, that's going to take us like hours. I said, but at least we get down and we're alive. We were covered in mud. You couldn't even identify us. And people were still watching us and filming this. So I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Google. I don't even know what you would Google but or search for. But, oh, it took us about an hour and a half. And we got down and some guys like, I thought for sure we'd be calling search and rescue and a tow truck and you guys would be goners. And it's like, yeah, we're not. Thanks, though. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very embarrassing. And we went back to town with a tail between our legs and there were no photos that night. But a right. lesson learned. And yeah, that that that's probably the closest I've come to a total horror story where things could have gone even more terribly wrong. So <laughs> but yeah, we haven't forgotten that experience. <laughs> Always make sure to check your roads and don't go on roads that are clay after it rains. <laughs> Tip of the day. <laughs> Fantastic. Do you get home into the studio and upload your photos immediately and get into editing or you want to let them marinate for a while? And I do kind of both. Being on the road, 
so where I'm sitting right now, this is a house in Golden, Colorado that we share with my dad. Just because we're gone so much, it didn't make sense to have our own house. And he very graciously opened up his house. I make the joke that I'm 42 and I'm still living at my dad's. I'm living in the basement, but there's no shame. I did get out of the house at age 18. So I, I did all that. I'm just back. So we function completely on laptops on the road. So we have external hard drives that we work off of. So we do download our images from each outing, wherever we are. And then David's very good about diving into his pretty, pretty quickly. We both have a backlog. It's embarrassing to say this, but currently I'm going through 40,000 images from the last four years that I haven't even called or touched. And it's a problem that I need to address this year and just work on slowly. But I think we always have like a few favorite images from a trip that we know that we photographed right away. So we'll each get home and take them into Lightroom, work with them. And then I try to keep up on social media. So I'll release like one or two of those. Um, but for the most part, I think we let things marinate, but not on purpose. I think it's just because we're so busy traveling all the time. It's hard to go location. It, it, I shouldn't say it's hard. It's wonderful and we're grateful we're able to do that. But when you're teaching and going to a location, teaching, going to a location, you tend to fall behind on those things. So that is why we have such a massive backlog. We like to use our time here at home to do that. Rainy days, snowy days, but it's, it's going to take a while. But I would say we're trying to get better about it. David just got his Yellowstone images all processed from two weeks ago. I have not touched mine yet. I've touched one that I released a few weeks ago on so or a week ago on social media. So he's definitely better. And it's not a competition, but it's hard like when he's like, I've got all my Yellowstone ones done. And I'm like, oh my God, like you're gonna release them. And I, I'm not even near mine. And it, it's totally fine. We each do things in our own time. But yeah, I, I would say it's probably 50-50. Sometimes I let them marinate just because I can't get to them. Other times, if I, I do know that I have a few things that I like, I will consciously, purposely let them marinate for a few months and just go back every now and then and maybe process a few. And then if I just don't, if I'm not feeling it, if I'm not, if it's not coming out the way I like, I'll step back and give it a break, which I think is very important to learn how to recognize to do too, because you can get pretty frustrated working on an image and something's just not turning out right or it's not what you expected. I usually have a lot of happy surprises where on the LCD in the field, I go, oh my gosh, this is my new favorite image. Like, I love this. But then I get it in front of me on the computer and I go, huh, yeah, it's not singing to me like it did in the field. But oh, here's this one that I didn't even remember taking. And oh, look at this one. This is much nicer. And I like this one. And there's a lot of that with me. <laughs> no shame. It's just how we I, I like those ones where you you're pushing the shutter but you're talking to somebody yeah <laughs> so you're not even really concentrating on that image and you get it back yes and it's either of those two responses it's either oh this is wonderful or what was I thinking you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> clearly I wasn't thinking anything because I was just hanging on to the camera and pushing the button <laughs> for sure yeah no it is funny I do like to joke, too, that there are some, like, unintentional camera movement things that happen. Either I'm, like, I've hit the shutter while I'm taking my tripod down or carrying my camera some way, and I go back and I go, huh, this is actually kind of cool. have no idea what it is, but it looks cool. <laughs> I've, I've had a few lucky ones like that and a lot of unlucky Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, it's just that's my own demon that I have to deal with. I just don't process quickly. I'm not a, I'm not a big processing person. Um, okay. I, I was going to ask, what, what does processing look like? Is it five yeah, minutes it's, image or is it a you know, couple of hours for some people if on, on a single image is the way they go? And I've done that a few times and sometimes it's rewarding. Sometimes you get at the end of it and you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I have like five steps that I do. I... I envy the people that can process and produce those amazing works. I just, I don't have the bandwidth to sit there and do that. Mm. I try to get, I know this sounds cliche, but I, I try to get it as close to perfect in the field. And my processing consists of every single time I just take it into Lightroom. I play with my midtones, my white slider, 
maybe bring the shadows up a little. I do push my blacks up high, which I know is the opposite of what some people say. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then it's just taking it into Photoshop for dust spot removal and maybe the TK panel. I just play with my midtones just a, a smidge more. And that's pretty much yeah. it. I like to get in and out in under 10 minutes on an image yeah. because I do have that mentality where sometimes I can overthink things. So I mm -hmm. find that if I sit there and experiment and try a bunch of different things, it can end up frustrating me more than just knowing, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. I just need to do this and this and I'm done. And I, I'm not Photoshop technical <laughs> other no. than dust spots and midtones and the TK panel. Like I can't, I just can't wrap my mind around it. <clears throat> and I, I'd rather be out shooting too. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm just not a good person that sits behind the computer a lot all day and enjoys it. But to those people that can, that's amazing. Some people are just amazing with processing. But yeah, I'm definitely a in and out <laughs> very cool. quick. You mentioned earlier on every photographer goes through slumps and hits that wall where they go, it's just not working for me. Have you got any techniques that you use to get yourself out of the, the rut or get yourself out of that slump? So I had a very challenging year, like personally and photographically last year. 2023 was not my year. And we all go through these seasons. And photographically, it was my least productive year ever. And that was in due partly to my mental status at the time. It was just a very stressful year. There was a lot going on. I was very busy with other things that kind of kept me away from my camera. Lots of travel, not for workshops, but just for some other things. Mm. And I just, I wasn't feeling it. I had maybe, I didn't even do like, I usually like to round out like my favorite images of the year for a certain year at the end of the year. And yeah. I I had nothing for last year. I had a few that were special to me in certain ways, but it was a very unproductive year. And like I said, it was mostly based on my mental status, but I didn't push. I didn't make myself. I just embraced the lulls. And I said, you know yeah. what? I just, it's fine. Go take a nap or today, maybe go focus on painting. Or mm -hmm. I also ride horses and I have a horse that I ride when I'm home. And put myself more into writing last year just because I think it's important not to push yourself because then you're creating that pressure box and then it just leads to more disappointment and more frustration. What did help me out of my slump was just getting back out into the field and hiking. So after a particularly rough fall last year, I had a riding accident. We lost our cat to kidney disease. It was very stressful, very sad. We had some other things going on. We went to Death Valley and classically Death Valley is a place where we go to either grieve or kind of deal with our emotions. I know that sounds totally cliche, Death Valley, and but I was there a few years ago when my mom passed away. Sure. So it's always been, I had to get over the aversion of after the initial incident that something bad happened in one of my favorite places. And once I did, I connected with the landscape even more deeply. I healed David was also there right after his mom passed away. Unfortunately, we lost our mothers pretty close together. So it's just always been a place of comfort. So at the end of everything last year in November, we were just feeling totally defeated. I said, we're going to Death Valley. And it wasn't even to photograph. It was mostly just to be in our happy place and even just hike. We put in over 60 miles in two weeks. We just got out. We moved our feet literally walked out our emotions, but then also picked up our cameras and photographed along the way. And that really got me out of my slump because it was a, com it was a very comfortable place for me. But that key of just getting out still into nature, even not photographing is always what kind of picks me up out of my slumps. And that's where I really stress that keeping your relationship with nature going, even if you're not photographing is very important, not only for your mind and your body and your soul, but also that photography spirit, it just keeps that relationship open. You may not be holding a camera, but that's okay. Just go enjoy the experience. Because I also find that as photographers, when you do this full time, it's easy to become complacent and you lose that, not gratitude, but you, yeah, you start taking things for granted. <clears throat> and I think a slump is great because it puts everything back under like perspective and how fortunate you are to be able to go out and do this and see the things. Yeah. And 
that just always brings me back. It's keeping the main thing. Why did we all head out into nature with our cameras in the first place? Some of it is to deal with sadness, depression, anxiety. You just love nature. You want to share and keeping that relationship open and going still keeps that little connection going in our minds and our hearts. And then you're able to go out and that it'll come back. You just can't force it, which is why last year I just did not force it. I wasn't feeling it. So I'm going to go focus on some other things and it'll eventually bring, bring me back around. And financially, I was just grateful. I was in a spot where I could do that or I didn't have to take the time. We didn't have to add extra workshops on. We were just able to sit get ourselves back together and just get back on the horse speaking. But yeah. Where do you see society fitting? uh, Sorry. Where do you see photography fitting in society? Oh gosh, that's a tough one that, I mean, with all the changes going on right now, especially Mm. with AI, social media, influencers, the landscapes changing in the park. Everyone's a photographer as well. Yeah. Like it's, I always think there will be a place for it. Even the, I remember when NFTs were a big thing a few years ago. I never got into those. I still couldn't even tell you how Bitcoin works. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I just avoided that whole thing just because I didn't know. But I, I had someone tell me once, well, you're going to be left behind. You, this is the way the world is going. And if you don't do it, you're just going to be a nobody. You're, you're going to go the way of the dinosaurs. And I just thought that is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard, but okay. And I'm still here. Asteroid yeah. hasn't taken me out yet. Still doing photography. And now those of they're still going. They're definitely not in the spotlight. I've had the um, Yeah. So I, I still think there will always be a place for this. Yeah. People like stories and people enjoy seeing these photos and not everyone in our world has the opportunities to travel to these places to yeah. see them for themselves. And I just think there's so much power in a photograph that can elicit a feeling, a sense of place, a dream, an inspiration. And I think there will always be a place with that. AI is, I know that's the big elephant in the room now, and I really, I don't have an opinion like either way, but I I still think there will always be a place for just good old photography. New things may come in, take the spotlight for a while and leave. There's still no replacement for a photograph, in my opinion. You just can't replicate that no matter how hard or how amazing AI is because it's just about that personal experience. The early early 20th century, late 19th century, there was talk when photography was just starting that painting was going to become irrelevant. And I don't see that disappearing anytime soon either. No. I follow painters almost daily now on Instagram. Painting is a big inspiration for my own photography and landscapes because they just, the compositions they paint, the way that, you know, Thomas Beer or uh, Thomas Moran and Albert Bierstadt, two of my favorite oh. American landscape painters, the way that they used light and that atmospheric, it just, that's what inspires me. And I'm finding new painters every day that still paint fascinating things and I think there's something to learn from painters and other different art forms to incorporate into your photography but yeah the same thing you could say the same thing happened even when digital came around I remember film people saying oh this is the end of film and I know at least 10 other photographer colleagues that are still shooting with film and doing amazing things Mm -hmm. I think it's just a natural progression that these things will different things will come in take the spotlight claim they're going to be the next new thing but i i maybe i'm old-fashioned or naive i don't know maybe both but i honestly feel that there will always be a place to have a photograph to share a story elicit a feeling Mm -hmm. and share the world with people i think it's still a very powerful way to communicate what goes on in our world what do you like to do when you're not shooting or not doing photography yeah so i i like to i need to get back into diving so underwater i know This kind of isn't the question, but I I do want to get into underwater photography, but I've been an avid scuba diver since I was 12. So I'd like to get back underwater. I'm an avid equestrian, so I've been riding horses since I was six. So I I spend a lot of time with my horse. I like to paddleboard, read, and hike. And I'd say those are probably the 
the top activities that I do if I'm not photographing. Um, yeah. And it's, it's hard to find a balance. There are definitely days that I think this is a common question that we get as photographers that live on the road is you must get up for every sunrise and every sunset. You're out there every day. And it's no, I can tell you from a business point, we've been working in the trailer and looking out the window and going, oh yeah, look what's happening outside. Great. (laughs) And we just enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the same thing. The best sunsets happen when you're coming out of the grocery store. Oh, yeah. Park it. yeah. <laughs> when, when I was working full time, it was always I'm, I'm on the train on the way into town and <laughs> there, there's that magnificent sunrise and I'm going, yeah. We don't do it every single day. And it's it's important to find balance. And yeah, keeping those other activities on the side just help me get out of this world and go back into other worlds and yeah. It's just, yeah, it's all about finding a good balance because it's hard being a full-time creative. You do hit slumps. It's not an everyday activity by any sense of the means, and it's always evolving. But yeah, I think it's very important to have other activities outside of photography. Yeah, totally agree. We need to start wrapping up, so I've got a couple of questions for you. Are there any photographers that I should be talking to? I don't know if you've already done it. Anna Morgan? She is on my list though. Yes. I love Anna and her work and her, her conservation angle too is just fascinating and how she incorporates that in. Gosh, I should have had my list. I always have a list with me in these things and I just didn't prepare one this time. Gosh, there's so many other people. What about, there's a guy, I'm going to butcher your name. I'm so sorry. His name is Eric Erlenbush. He's EE visual on Instagram. He's pretty fascinating. I like his work. Gosh. Yeah. I have a list. I promise. I'm just on the spot now. I can't think of anyone. But yeah, there was a lot of newer names that haven't had their chance to shine in the sun yet. And they just perform amazing works. Um, There's actually, there's a woman that I just started following a few years ago, Karen Waller. I do believe she's from Australia. She does amazing botanical multiple exposures. I see. Um, I absolutely love her work. But yeah, no, there's a few. I just can't, I can't think of any, but Anna, she's always been an inspiration to me and I just love hearing her speak of her works. But yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. My final questions, one that I've been trying to get to the bottom of throughout this podcast. And it's for many listeners, the most important question I can ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? I do. Okay. (laughs) I do. I, David makes fun of me and he would just discuss him, but I do yeah. like pineapple on my pizza. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for taking the time to speak to me. Where can people find your work? They can find me at jenniferrenwick.com. That's my main website. And then my other big presence is Instagram. So it's jennifer.renwick.photography. I'd say those are the two best places to connect with me. And then there's an email address. I always encourage people to reach out. I love hearing from people just talking about anything. So yeah, those are the two best places to get a hold of me. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Grant. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, YouTube, Twitter, Threads, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.